the people filtering, filtering in in the back right so now. Uh, for folks who don't know, my name is Stuart Baum. I'm the president of the Student Hi, Senate. Where you uh, it's my honor this morning to introduce not just one, but two university leaders. Um, so this will be a really good morning. Um, so first, of course, I'm going to introduce President M. Roy Wilson. Uh, president Wilson, of course, is our 12th president. Um, he's presided over this university during a tremendous period of growth um, through the celebration of our sesquicentennial, uh, through our largest, the enrollment of our largest freshman class Did ever, um, through the explosion there? of our public health program into a fully fledged department. Um, and all of this stuff, all these great milestones are really um, a testament so and have come about in part and in whole through President Wilson's leadership and our testament to the idea that when we work together, we can really get a lot of great things done on campus for the students and for our whole and campus community. Well. Mm -hmm. Now, I've also gotten to get to know President Wilson on a personal level, working with him through Student Senate, bringing him many student concerns and needs, and I've really appreciated his care and passion for those needs and concerns, um, and it's been a pleasure working with him to get those addressed. Um, now, I'd also like to introduce Dean John Corvino. Uh, so, of course, Dean Corvino is the second dean of the Honors College, um, new but not so new anymore, um, really, you know, filling a, a big footsteps uh, in their founding dean, Dean Herring, um, but I would like to say that he has really done a good job of filling those shoes. Um, I actually first met him uh, as my professor in one of his classes, um, and I can say that he is just as good of a dean as he was a professor. Um, after all, he keeps pushing me to join the Honors College, even though I'm graduating in May. <laughs> but in all seriousness, yes. Uh, in all seriousness, um, he, I look upon him as a friend and a mentor, and he has been for many student leaders before me, and, and for that we are really thankful. Um, so it's a very exciting and consequential time to be at Wayne State, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the good conversation that we're about to have about where we've been, uh, where we are today, uh, and where we're going. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce President M. Roy Wilson and Dean John Corvino to the stage. Go ahead. Hey, Stuart. Thank you. Come on, listen. Good morning. Uh, Stuart, it's not too late. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming out this morning. So let me say a little bit about the format. Traditionally, the president has done an annual State of the University address. I don't know about all of you, but I'm at that point in the semester where the thought of listening to one more lecture, <laughs> and I say that as someone who gives lectures, I say that as someone who enjoys hearing you speak, but we thought we would do something, we thought we'd do something a little bit different and have a casual conversation about issues that concern the university community. And so we asked members of that community, students, faculty, staff from around the university to submit questions. And we will be covering some of those questions today. We will not be able to cover all of them, but I am told that if people submitted a question, they will receive some answer at some point. Even if we don't get to it today, they'll get an email or something like that. So let me start with some sort of lighthearted warm-up questions. You and the Board of Governors. Let me give a little context for that question. <laughs> because, you know, leading up to this, a lot of people are saying, oh, you're going to interview the president. It's going to be all very scripted and canned. You're going to ask him about how he likes bike riding and, and, and all that. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're at Wayne State. We're in Detroit. We like to keep it real. And I thought, let's start with a, an elephant in the room kind of thing. Uh, because a lot of people know that there's been tension uh, surrounding the Board of Governors. Half the board has sued the other half of the board. Some board members have expressed criticism of you, other board members have defended you. It's got to be a sort of tense time with all that. What's your take on the situation and how we might move forward? Wow, you really uh, <laughs> believe in uh, starting off hard hitting, don't you? I um, enjoyed being dean. I really did. It was yeah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say this, um, and I, I just need to publicly say this first, that um, there's probably not a in fact, there is not a day that goes by that I don't get someone from the university community, whether it's faculty, whether it's staff, whether it's grounds people or the custodial staff, uh, to people throughout the city who don't offer me encouragement and uh, hope that things will change, but also just personally yeah, very, very supportive, and, and I do appreciate that. So uh, let me just start off with that. 
I think, it, as, as you've mentioned, uh, there have been some challenges uh, on the board. I think that um, uh, without getting into the specifics of the lawsuit, I think that's pretty much a, a, a done deal. Um, we're moving forward with decisions that have been made. Uh, and my attitude is that as long as we can continue to move the university forward, then we just continue to do what we do and um, try to keep the board politics at a minimum and, or at least private and uh, just continue to move the university forward. We've got, we've got to concentrate on all the good things that's going on. And as we continue with this conversation, uh, I, I think you'll see that there really are a lot of good things going on. And we need to focus on that. And as long as we can, we can get past the things that need to get past to move the university forward, we can try our best to keep things uh, uh, from being too public. Uh, but the important thing is, is to keep the university forward. In terms of moving, moving forward, one of the uh, points of concern has been our relationship with the Henry Ford Health System. Yeah. Um, could you say a little bit about the status of those discussions? There had been a yeah. memorandum of understanding and then sure, that, sure. that got put on pause. Yeah. Where are we? Yeah. So um, let me start off with a truism. Um, no medical center or medical school can function without the clinical enterprise, whether that's the faculty practice plan or the hospital system subsidizing research and education. Now, I'll, I'll do a slight caveat to that. A, a purely community-based medical school that does no research might be able to but every other medical school in the country relies on the subsidization of research and education from the clinical enterprise. And we're not, we, we're not in a position where we're getting that here because you know, I think it's no secret Tenet is a uh, for-profit um, uh, corporation in which their uh, main concern is, is shareholder uh, profit. So we have to do something or, cha uh, or change fundamentally what kind of medical school we have. Uh, having said that, I, I, uh, you asked me specifically about the Henry Ford situation. I think that um, Henry Ford is one uh, institution that does have similar uh, mission and um, goals that, that we do to have academic aspirations. And it would be nice to uh, have a deeper partnership with them. I think it would be to our mutual benefit. Um, having said that, because of the, the, um, the, the recent um, um, tension, what's the, well, no, it's, it's more than tension. Uh, the, the, the recent shooting down of a, a letter of intent um, you know, we've had to put some things on hold. But that's the bigger transformational vision. There are a lot of things that can be done that continues to deepen that partnership in a mutually beneficial way that doesn't require board approval. Um, and we are continuing to do those things. We have a deep relationship already. We have over 100 medical students that are trained there. We have research collaborations. We have uh, faculty who have joint appointments. Uh, so we have a lot already. And there are other um, partnerships that we can continue to work on that will deepen um, that working relationship. Because ultimately, it's, it's all about trust. And uh, we have to take you know, baby steps at this point and continue to do things that we can do to bring back that trust. And at some point, you know, the, the board will change again. Um, you know, it's an it's a elected board, and uh, there are changes all the time. And in the meanwhile, we'll continue to uh, educate the board on the importance of uh, having a trusted clinical partner and uh, continue to work and get the things accomplished that we can. We are right now in the midst of a search for a VP of Health Affairs and Dean of the School of Medicine. Any updates on that search? It's going exceedingly well. I, I will say that the first um, round interviews have been completed, 
and the caliber of candidates, the pool of candidates that we've had is as good or better than in any search I've seen. It is a phenomenal pool of candidates. So we have a short list that uh, has been uh, selected from the uh, initial pool. Um, that short list is not the short, short list, but it's the second short list, is, is um, uh, going to be interviewed on campus. And we'll have uh, interviews with select groups. And then out of that, uh, there'll be a short, short list of, of two or three uh, names that are provided to me and to the provost and we'll decide who to uh, invite back uh, one or two or, th or all three for further um, uh, interviews. And so that's the process. Uh, we think that we'll be able to complete it by the end of the year. Uh, uh, academic year? Or acad uh, no, um, calendar, calendar year. year. Okay. Yeah, we'll be able to complete it by the end of the calendar year. And uh, as I said, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's an exceptional pool of candidates. I, I think that um, you know, some people have wondered if some of the, the tensions and discord um, that's going on here is, is going to keep people away. And I would just tell you that um, you know, there are people out there who want to challenge and who think there are great opportunities here in Detroit and who, like many Detroiters, just want to roll up their sleeves and, and just get in there and get it done. And those are the type of people we're, we're getting. Uh, they're, you know, some of them, are, I mean, they're all academically accomplished, but, but many of them um, are looking for a challenge, and, and they've had challenges all their career, and they're looking for another uh, big challenge and to make an a impact. And that's the type of person we want, so I'm very pleased. Talk about some of those opportunities. What are some of the things that they're excited about when they look at Wayne State and that, that you're excited about when you reflect back on the, the last few years of Wayne State? Well, you know, th there are a lot of things uh, positive going on, both in the city and at the university. You know, when you try to step back a bit and just look objectively about it, I mean, there has been a lot of national press about Wayne State over the past several years. Uh, you know, our APOU award for degree completion, um, being number one in the country for rate of change and graduation rate, our, our research um, uh, expenditures continuing to go up. Um, our Pivotal Moments campaign being uh, completed, not only on time, but ahead of schedule. Um, there are a lot of positive things, and, and they're, they're, they're seeing that, and, and they're seeing the, the leadership of, of our senior administrators who are, are going around you know, throughout the country um, in their respective areas to talk about some of the things that we're doing here and, um, and being an example of some of the things that could be done. So they see that. And then on the other hand, at the medical school, they, they see a situation where the leadership uh, of, the, of the medical school is not broken. It's, it's actually a good leadership team. The raw ingredients are here. You have a, a very um, a sick population that needs help. Uh, you have health disparities here that uh, needs to be addressed. You have large, uh, committed, eager uh, uh, medical students who choose Wayne State because they are committed to those kind of values and those ideals. Uh, we have a very diverse um, uh, mixture of, of students that uh, appeals to you know, many of the, uh, the candidates. Um, and, and so when you look at it from a just uh, objectively and just kind of step back, th there really are a lot of positive things and the potential to do something fabulous is, is there. Uh, Detroit is on the way back. Uh, they see that and they see the, the impact that Wayne State is having as part of that. And uh, many of them just want to be part of something that is impactful. You mentioned some of the student success initiatives and our rapid change in graduation rates, things like that. We received a question um, regarding student athletes. The person said, student athletes are doing so well, should we try to replicate their academic support model across campus? What are your thoughts about a proposal like that? Yeah, our student athletes are phenomenal. Let me start off there. Um, a, a couple of things to consider. 
Uh, first of all, they, they do a great job. Their graduation rate is much higher than the general population. Uh, I will say that in Division II and Division III athletics, the typical student athlete does come in a little better prepared than the typical student. That's not necessarily the same in Division I, but in Division II and Division III, that is the case. But, but even aside from that, there are a lot of support systems that are put in place for the students. So can that be replicated? Yes. Um, uh, we do have a, a program called Warrior VIP that was initiated in 2017. Uh, more intense mentoring, uh, advising. Uh, these are students who we believe are at risk. I mean, they, they need a little extra help. Their, their admission to Wayne State, their criteria was not quite as high as the, uh, the general student population, but we give them in, intense attention, and um, including a freshman year seminar that uh, many of them uh, take. And I will tell you that um, the first cohort, that's in 2017, the retention into the uh, third year is 80% for that cohort. If you include the, if, uh, the um, freshman year seminar, if, if they took that, it's 82%. The, the black students in that, in that cohort is 83%. This is into the third year, not the second year. That's almost twice as high as the retention rate of black students that are not in that cohort. So, so you know, how do we scale that? Well, it's, uh, we're looking at that. We, wanna, uh, we don't think that we need to scale it for the entire university. We have, to, we have to do it for those who we need the most help. And it, it will cost about, to, do, to scale it to about 3,000 of our most uh, uh, at-risk students, it, it will cost about $4 million a year. And uh, as part of an initiative for APLU called Powered by Publix, there are clusters of universities all um, committed to increasing the number of graduates uh, from from college by the year 2025. We're in, one, we're in what's called the urban cluster, and I lead that cluster for us. There's about 10 institutions in each cluster. And um, we have a commitment to increase the um, number of graduates by the year 2025, but importantly, to decrease the gap between white and black students by half by 2025. This is a commitment of all the clusters. That's really actually very difficult. Just to give you some historical context, the, um, when you look at all public universities, the increase in the graduation rate has averaged for the past decade about 0.4% per year. If you look at the cluster institutions, remember these are institutions that, that are self-identifying um, to want to be very involved in, in this initiative. So there are institutions that for the most part are, are, have programs and, and are really focused on this. Uh, for white students, it's 0.6% per year. And for black students, it's 0.8% per year. So you can, you can see that to um, you know, really make a difference and have the disparities that there has to be a huge difference in the graduation rates between white and black students. We, um, um, I think, have done well. I, 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 you know, there has been some, some, um, some comments that our graduation rate improved so much because we're you know, selecting uh, students more, it's more selective. You know, I just would like to point out that you know, the board uh, made a change in the admission standards in 2012. So the very first class that that would have been operational is 2013, that cohort. That's, even if, if it was fully operational, I'm not even sure it was in 2013. But you the were first, what year? 2013. 2013. So the, the first class that that could possibly have impacted is 2013. Um, so that class, <coughs> the six year graduation, would have been calculated in 2019, this, this past year. When we got the award by APLU and got the distinction as being number one in the country in the rate of improvement, that was for the class that graduated in 2017. So they would have come in in 2011 
during the old emissions sta uh, standards. So that, that's not the reason. It's, it, the reason is because we have some real committed, dedicated staff that is making students first and that are uh, working really hard every day to um, you know, make sure that outcome. And, and just again, to just put this in context, you know, I mentioned that the APOU institutions that's in the cluster, that the average rate of increase in the graduation rate was 0.6 or 0.8, whether you're white or black. You know, ours was 21% over six years. That's, you know, vastly different than, than, the, um, than what the rest of the, the, the country is experiencing. So, you know, I wouldn't make light of the fact that um, uh, we have some real committed, really uh, competent people who are thinking about these things uh, every day and uh, doing everything they can to make sure that students succeed. You talk a lot about the numbers about rates of improvement and particularly challenges for minority students. And those numbers are very important. And of course, a lot of this, you know, we look at it by looking at the numbers. But I've got to imagine this has got to be an issue of some personal salience for you, right? You're, you're an African-American president with an African-American provost uh, in the city of Detroit. I mean, you don't, you don't talk about the personal salience a lot, do you? Do, but I've heard you occasionally talk a little bit about your own backstory. Is that, is that something you want to say more about? Well, you know, it, it's, it's not even my own story. It's also the provost's story. You know, he likes to uh, talk to particularly African-American students that's having trouble and uh, point to his own example where um, he was not a great student and um, there were certain programs that helped him and he um, has been you know, wildly successful. Uh, I don't talk about my background that much, but you know, certainly um, you know, I'm also uh, first generation. I, uh, um, in my whole extended family to go to college, I take this very seriously. I love education. I, uh, I'm, I'm passionate about it. I think it's the equalizer for our society. Um, and, and my life's work has really been uh, committed to uh, dealing with disparities of all kinds, whether it's health or whether it's in education. Uh, and, you know, sometimes people uh, don't recognize what you do. Uh, people outside recognize what you do more than people inside, you know, you know that story. But, you know, I think that I, I have a lot of um, uh, leadership roles nationally uh, trying to increase the uh, number of African Americans uh, in all minorities in uh, not only in uh, leadership positions and education and, and, and health, but in, in many different uh, venues, um, in, including in, in biomedical research. Staying on this theme for a moment, we talk about um, educational disparities. We're talking about um, uh, challenges for underserved minority populations. Of course, one of those challenges is financial. And we have a question about the student debt crisis. Yeah. Uh, and the question is, are there going to be opportunities for in-state students to attend Wayne State University tuition free? I think this might be influenced by some of the Democratic candidates talking about free yeah. college, maybe. Yeah. Um, are there going to be any initiatives to forgive debt for graduating students? So we, you were talking about how expensive it is to do things. And, and yeah. Yeah. What, so, do you say, what do so, you say to that question? Yeah. So you, you, you mentioned the uh, Democratic candidates right now. And a few of them are talking about free college. Um, um, you know, none of them are talking about how to pay for it. Right. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's it's a great ideal. It's just is uh, is difficult to uh, to do. I, I will say that um, that we have a lot of programs that we probably need to advertise better. Wayne Access, for example, is a uh, is a program where if you if you expect a family uh, contribution to your education is less than five thousand dollars. You can come to Wayne State with no out-of-pocket expense for tuition and fees, zero. Um, and if you expect it, family contribution from five to ten, it's a sliding scale. But if it's less than five thousand, and a lot of Detroit families are, are going to have expected family contribution less than five thousand per year, you know, you can come to Wayne State. There are uh, three thousand students in that category that we've helped over the past three years. It's only been we've done this for three years now. So uh, over three thousand students have uh, been able to uh, take advantage of this. 
So, um, so that, that, that's one program. Certainly the Warrior Way Back program that's getting national attention is another way of trying to help the students and relieve their debt. Uh, a number of years ago, we drastically changed our financial aid structure to de-emphasize, I probably shouldn't put, put the word de-emphasize. In, in the past, um, we were actually paying really good students to come to Wayne State. And, and they were, the, the, the um, financial aid, the grants particularly, were being skewed in that direction. Um, we made some changes so that it was it skewed much more now toward need. We still have merit, but it's skewed much more toward need. And so there are a lot more students who are able to take advantage of this. And uh, that's been very helpful. And so combine that with Wayne Access and Warrior Way Back and some of the other programs we have, the wardrobe program, the food bank. Um, you know, we're doing what we can to try to keep it as affordable as possible. And I will say this, I, I can't um, uh, publicly announce this yet because it's gonna be announced next week. And I'll just give you a hint. It's big enough that the governor will be here and the mayor will be here, but we're gonna be announcing another major scholarship initiative that we're going to uh, start next year that um, directly talks to your, your uh, question. So stay tuned for next week. Foreshadowing. <laughs> um, you mentioned a number of programs in there, including Warrior Wardrobe. You know, I've been on the road going to some of the alumni events, and, and people think that's a really cool thing. You know, people who have clothes to donate, bring them students who need clothes, maybe for a job interview, maybe for something else, pick them up. Um, it made me think a little bit more about how residential life has changed on this campus. I, I've been here for 21 years. When I came here, this still had a reputation as being very much a commuter school. Uh, and that's been changing over the years. Uh, we have a question from somebody who is a new employee in housing and residential life who is saying, how do you see campus housing and residential living uh, impacting student success? How important is that and, 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 and how, can, you know, how can we create better access for that? Well, all the, the um, studies show that if you live on campus, you're just more engaged. You're more engaged, you're, you participate in uh, campus activities a lot more. You make uh, more friends. You get to know your teachers uh, uh, better. And so in terms of student success, uh, living on campus is um, uh, a big step. Uh, we try to go even a step beyond that in some ways. You mentioned athletics earlier. You know, one of the things that athletics does is they live together. And so some of the programs that we have are, is a cohort model where, where we try to encourage uh, students with certain um, um, likenesses, whether it's interests or whatever, to live together and support each other as a cohort. The Med Direct is that way, for example. And that adds yet another layer beyond just living on campus, but another layer of engagement that most of the students have as a result of that. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we just opened our, had our uh, groundbreaking for um, the Anthony Wayne Apartments last week. It's a um, you know, phenomenal apartment complexes. If you haven't been by there, you really need, you know, just to give you an idea, the, the uh, studios, um, uh, they each have not twin beds, but full-size beds, um, full-size refrigerator, uh, a little stove, um, and uh, their own bathroom. That's like living in an apartment. Um, before I go any further, let me um, uh, just say that at the event was, you know, one of our, a uh, couple of our Board of Governors, but I see Marilyn Kelly here, so I want to acknowledge uh, her from the Board of Governors. And, Excuse me? Kim Trent. Oh, okay. Oh, Kim, yeah. <laughs> and they were the two that were there last week at the, at the, uh, um, the opening, too. So th thank you both for being here. And I just want to also acknowledge uh, Jacqueline for uh, being here also. You talk about cohorts, you talk about the importance of living together. Um, one of the things I find striking about Wayne State is that we are a diverse campus, at least in terms of our student population, and diverse across diverse dimensions, racially diverse, religiously diverse, economically diverse. 
At the same time, we are living in a deeply polarized society. Uh, it's harder and harder for people to sort of come together. Uh, people have con been concerned about a, a lack of civility in politics, social media, and so on. Do you think Wayne State, as a public urban research institution of the sort that it is, can have a distinctive role in all of that, in being a model for how we might do better? Are there things that we are doing, could be doing, should be doing uh, to create a better conversation across different divides and actually bring students and others together? So the short answer is yes, but I, but I, I think that we have to be intentional about it. I, I don't think we can just assume because we're a diverse community that that's basically it. I, I think we still have to work at it. We have to be, you know, diversity and inclusivity are two different concepts. We have to, you know, really work at being inclusive. And, um, and, and the whole concept of civility is, is one that is something that I worry about. Uh, you, know, you mentioned nationally, I think the, the national discourse has been um, difficult. Um, if you watch the, uh, watch the Democratic um, uh, candidacy debates yesterday, um, you know, they're going after each other. Um, you know, at, in academia, in universities, the, the hallmark of universities is that they are places for constructive debate and um, um, you know, freedom of expression and uh, you know all of these things that have made universities great from the very beginning as, as uh, you know, areas of, of um, uh, society where if there's one place to be able to express yourself and to be able to um, uh, treat people with um, uh, with different views in, 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 a, in a respectful way, it's, it's at the universities. And uh, there certainly has been, I think, a, even at universities, a, a, a bit of a tension, um, which uh, I, I hope we can, as a society and as a university community, uh, do something about. I think it, it starts from the top, and um, uh, when, when uh, leaders, are not civil, then you know people take that as a signal that they can mirror those kinds of behavior. So uh, the good thing is that you know, in the same way that negativity feeds upon negativity, positivity feeds upon positivity. And if we can, you know, just keep that in mind and 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 make all of our interactions uh, respectful and, and and civil and and compassionate. Um, I think that that could feed upon itself, and we can do the kind, you know, be the kind of model that, that you mentioned. I will say that uh, I was deeply moved by a uh, lunch that I had oh, a couple of months ago. Uh, it was a lunch in which there were a number of Iraqi students um, had invited me to come for lunch, and um, we went around and we just had a conversation like we're doing now. And the thing that I was so impressed about was their um, wonderment of how people here at the university of different races, um, religions, political beliefs can sit around in the cafeteria and sit next to each other and, and talk to each other and, and, and laugh and be friends. And, um, they, that was just a concept that was so foreign to them that they were struggling with it. They were saying, how does this happen? Um, uh, because it's so foreign to them. And so I, I don't take uh, very lightly the fact that um, uh, not only Wayne State, but our society in general is, is much more open and much more uh, inclusive than many societies uh, throughout the world. But having said that, you have to continue to work at it and you have to be intentional about it. You talk about inclusiveness as something that doesn't happen by accident, that we have to be intentional and thoughtful about. One concern that's been raised is that while we have a very diverse student body, we have greater challenges with that with respect to faculty diversity. And what are we doing to make sure, A, that we hire diverse faculty, B, that we make them feel included, C, that for all faculty, our 
lessons, our research, the way we, we conduct ourselves uh, are inclusive and open and welcoming yeah. for, for all students. So let me break that into two parts. The first is the, um, the recruitment part. How do we get a more diverse uh, faculty? And, and certainly, um, it starts with the search process. And uh, one of the things that we've changed is that search processes begin with a, um, a, a training on uh, implicit bias. Uh, it, even before that, the, the search committee needs to be diverse, and, and so there has to be a lot of attention placed on the search committees. But then once the search committee is formulated, OEO actually uh, does a training session uh, with the uh, search committees on implicit bias. The power of implicit bias, I, I, I've learned so much over the past um, 10 years on how powerful our biases are and how it impacts all of us. You know, even I, I think of myself as being pretty um, uh, enlightened in that way. And, and I found my own biases that I have and, and how you have to you know, protect against those. And it's not something that, that um, that's why it's called implicit. It's not something that we necessarily recognize, uh, but it's very powerful. And so that's, that's one th uh, thing. The other thing I, I would just mention is that um, this is not an excuse, but um, when you look at our peers, nationally, we're actually ranked number one in terms of the diversity of our faculty. Um, and this is you know, number two and three and four are other institutions that you would be, you would um, think about, you know, Temple was in there, um, uh, UIC is in there, University of Houston is in there. This is urban research uh, universities. Urban research universities. But we are number one. And so um, that's not to say that we should be satisfied with that because we have to continue to uh, do what I, I just mentioned and make sure we're intentional about it. Um, and, and so the problem, part of the problem stems from the pipeline. And, and that's where a lot of my personal efforts uh, have been. I'm um, uh, chair of an NIH committee on, on um, diversifying the biomedical research workforce. I'm, I'm, I'm part of an APLU NSF uh, grant that's, um, that's looking at diversifying the professoriate and, and non-researchers, uh, but in the professoriate um, more broadly. My uh, uh, personal um, uh, commitment in terms of uh, healthcare has been, there's been a, um, a, um, a push that, uh, and, and some of it is, is subtle, that if you're a minority, you go into primary care and you go out into the community. There's nothing wrong with that. But, well, then who's going to be the teachers? Who's going to be the faculty? Who's going to be the deans and the, and the, and the chairs of departments and, and, the, and the presidents of universities? You know, I mean, we have to get beyond the thinking that if you're a minority, you should uh, go out into the community and serve the community. That's great. But we also have to cultivate our leaders. And, and that's part of what this whole MedDirect thing is, is to cultivate leaders so that when they're through, that they are the faculty. And uh, um, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a pipeline issue also. Staying on the oh, thing. Oh, and, and then sure. I, I didn't answer the other part, which is, so, so even if, um, okay, so put that aside for a second, the recruitment aside. You know, we have a, a fairly diverse uh, faculty, but not everyone is on minorities. So how do we make sure that, that there's inclusive teaching and, and inclusivity in terms of their, their pedagogy and, and so forth? And I, I know that the provost has been thinking a lot about this, and I don't know the, the individual uh, programs, um, but I know that Darren uh, Ellis has, uh, has been working on something where, uh, and, um, um, and Marie uh, uh, Kano has been, uh, you know, working on, on something to that effect. And so there, there are things going on to, on the pedagogy side and the uh, faculty development side uh, to make sure that um, there's inclusivity, it, it permeates the, the teaching environment. 
So staying on the theme of faculty leadership, we have impressive faculty at this university. Uh, we are a, a Carnegie Tier 1 research institution. Uh, faculty are world-class leaders in their fields. What are we doing to recognize that, to showcase that, to promote that? Are we doing enough? Could we do more? We can always do more. Um, you know, most of it is initially first at the department and school level. Um, and I, I hope that each school and each department is, um, you know, recognizes the, the uh, importance of their faculty and the accomplishments of their faculty and appropriately recognizes them. But at a, at a university level, um, you know, despite the, the um, budget crunches over the, the past 10 years, one of the things that we have not changed, we have not cut back on at all, are the various programs that we have to recognize faculty, whether it's the, the uh, Board of Directors uh, Faculty Distinction Award, uh, whether it's um, uh, the different prizes that, that we have uh, to uh, incent faculty to, to um, uh, the Murray Johnson, I think that's the name of the, the I, I'm looking at, I'm looking at, <laughs> at you, Julie. <laughs> uh, uh, the Murray Johnson Award. Jackson, Murray Jackson. Murray Jackson Award, that, yeah, yeah, for, yeah. Uh, for uh, creative scholars. I mean, these, these the distinguished, distinguished service professors, professors. Yeah, distinguished service professors. I mean, these are programs that we have not cut back on because we believe that, that it's important to recognize our, our faculty. Um, so, let me see, I'm losing my train of thought here. Oh, and then the final thing, which is important, is that our, mar our communications and marketing under Michael Wright um, would love to hear from faculty who have their story to tell, and there's a way to do that on the website. So if, if you're being recognized for an award, um, uh, go on the website, you know, tell your story, and we'll try to get it out for you. So those are some of the, the ways to, that we're trying to recognize. And I believe Anne-Marie Cano also has a podcast on faculty leadership. Yep. So yeah. Yeah. there are these things. Yeah. Moving for a moment from faculty successes to some faculty concerns. Uh, there have been concerns raised, particularly in the last week, about the university's commitment to academic freedom. What do you want to say about that? Yeah, you know, um, I think it's unfortunate that um, it's come to the level it has come to. Um, yeah, I, I did receive a, a, a couple of emails, um, which I responded to, and there were three issues mainly. Um, uh, one was an issue of um, internal audit, doing an investigation, and whether they were overzealous. and using parking information and so forth. Uh, second was an is issue of, um, of a, a professor in the Department of English who you know, many people think um, uh, shouldn't be exposed to our students, but that's a different matter. Um, who there's intense feelings have been generated about him and there was some, some flyer, a flyer that was uh, posted which was tangentially um, um, uh, uh, relevant. Um, uh, but it was taken down, and uh, outrage about that. And then, and then the third issue was um, uh, an email that was uh, taken down uh, because the, uh, some people thought that it was, it was offensive. And, and I addressed all three of those, um, but I don't think that uh, some people thought that it went far enough. Um, uh, so on the issue of the of the um, investigation, uh, I pointed out that the thing that internal, the thing that costs, costs the university the most amount of money right, in terms of fraud is time fraud. And the Board of Governors have been very clear that they want internal audit to be very aggressive in, in addressing time fraud. And so I made the point that this is really an issue of you know how overzealous internal uh, how zealous um, 
internal audit should be. And that's something, that's the direction that's set by the board and that I would bring it up with the board. I brought it up with the previous audit committee of the board and they thought it was fine. This has been over a year. You know, they thought everything was fine and since it was brought up again, I'd, I'd bring it up again. It, and it was brought up with the audit committee of the uh, board last week. And um, uh, the board, again, felt that um, this internal audit is doing their job and they should be allowed to do their job the way they see fit. On the, on the second issue of the um, uh, taking down of the posters, um, I was, I met with the uh, policy committee personally and I was swayed by a member of the English department who felt that it wasn't just the issue of the poster being taken down, but that it was the culture in the, in the department of, in the past of, of trying to suppress some, um, uh, some of these expressions. And so I acknowledged that, well, then that's a problem. And Keith and I would, the provost and I will get together and we'll, you know, um, uh, find some appropriate way of affirming the importance of uh, free expression and um, uh, that we would make that public. Uh, and then the third issue had to do with the, the email situation. And, you know, I personally felt that it shouldn't have been taken down. I think the provost felt that it shouldn't have been taken down. But we also believe that it wasn't done with any maliciousness and uh, it was, they actually believed that that was, the content was uh, within the policy. Uh, the content was egregious enough that within the policies that we currently have at the university that it, it warranted it. Now, I don't agree with that, but I, I trust that that's what they believed. And, um, and, and I told in my letter, I responded and said that, you know, we probably need to look at the policy mm -hmm. because, uh, and I invite the policy committee to uh, work with the provost and, and, uh, and others to amend the policy so that it's very clear, um, but that there are instances where it, email should be taken down. A good example is if, if someone violates HIPAA regulations and, and, and puts out private health information. I mean, you have to take it down then. And so there are certain times when it is appropriate, so let's look at what those times are Let's come up with the policy. And um, I, I think it just wasn't good enough. You know, my feeling on that is that um, I'm, not, you know, I'm not gonna publicly call out these people. Mm -hmm. That's not the way I am. Yeah. You know, these are, these are hardworking people who every day come to the university, do the best that they can. And you know, not all of us are perfect. And sometimes we'll, you know, we make a mistake or we do something that others probably think we shouldn't do. But to publicly have to um, uh, humiliate them or, or call them out is, is, is also not appropriate. Um, you know, we are, we're all hardworking, we're all committed, we want the same things. You know, let's treat each other with some level of respect and give, some, give each other a, a little bit of um, benefit of the doubt that they're, they're acting in the best interest, they're trying to act in the best interest of the university. Thank you for that. Uh, we're coming to our last 10 minutes or so. Let me go to a more mundane faculty concern that's not just a faculty concern, it's a student concern as well. Elevators. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I teach in State Hall. I'm, I'm gonna be going there later to teach my class. Uh, you know, we've got some beautiful new you know, buildings, like I was at the Illich School yesterday, that's gorgeous, but, but State Hall, we've got some pro challenges. Say a bit about that. Yeah, so one of the things that's really great about the um, campus master plan that was recently uh, completed is that in, in addition to laying out a kind of a vision of how our campus could be in the next 10 years, there are some very practical things in it. One of the practical things in it is a, a real analysis of what our deferred maintenance needs are and what it would cost to address these needs and whether or not we should be addressing these needs or maybe not. Maybe there are some buildings that, that uh, we should demolish and um, uh, put up new ones uh, uh, or consolidate you know, uh, some 
services into or programs into uh, the better building. I mean, there's all those kinds of permutations. And one of the uh, practical things that came out of, of this is uh, a real good analysis of both State Hall and Scott, Scott Hall. Um, you know, for years we've been debating how much money to put into Scott Hall. And the, the verdict at this point now, based on the analysis that was done, is that it's a very inefficient building. It's, too, it's much bigger than it needs to be. And we probably need a new building. We do need a new building. But it's going to take, you know, it'll, it'll be the next capital campaign. It, it'll, it's gonna, it's, we're talking about a five to seven year time horizon at the, at the earliest. So what do you do in the meantime? Um, well, we can't just leave it the way it is. It's uh, uh, but just because we're going to end up getting a new building in some time in the future. We've got to make it functional now. And so we decided that we were going to make limited upgrades to it. Uh, we're investing in the vivarium because our researchers need to have a, a good vivarium during the time that they're going to continue to be in Scott Hall. Tell people what a vivarium is. It's, it's animal uh, like uh, facilities for research, um, mainly mice is, the, is what they're working on. Um, and I went to Scott Hall one day uh, just to look at it myself, and the elevators are terrible. I mean, they really are. And so we're in the last uh, board meeting, we were able to um, you know, pass a, a bond issue that's going to deal with the elevators. Scott Hall's the same thing. State Hall? Uh, yes, uh, State Hall's the same thing. I mean, there are you know, s substantial deferred maintenance issues there. Uh, we we, we um, uh, need to make some investments in it. It's a little different than Scott Hall in that it can be really renovated. And um, so we're going to start that process. And the elevators is, is, is the first part of the installment, of, so to speak, of um, getting it um, you know, up to the speed that it needs to be. Uh, but over uh, the subsequent years, um, you know, it, is, it is a priority to renovate um, uh, State Hall. And in fact, that's the top priority that we have now in the uh, capital plan that, that we give to the state each year is uh, to renovate uh, State Hall. So the master plan has, uh, give, gives us a vision for the, the future, but at the same time, it gives very practical uh, things that uh, we could be working on now. Mm -hmm. And elevators is certainly at the top of that list. So parts of it, we've already started implementation. Parts of it, we're waiting to see what kind of funding we have in the next capital campaign. For these last few questions, let's do a kind of lightning round and, and make it sort of quick. Uh, talking about things we're building, basketball stadium. Say something yeah. about that. And some people are wondering, does this mean we're thinking about going to Vision 1 in basketball? I know nothing about sports. I don't even know what yeah. that question means, but I'm going to ask you. <laughs> yeah. So um, let, let's take the last part first. Um, the, the decision to go to Division I or not is independent of the basketball arena. But they're related in the sense that if we were to make the decision to go to Division I, we couldn't do it right now because we don't have the facilities. So with the ba new basketball arena, we would be able to, we would have the facilities necessary to go to Division I, but that's a separate decision. There are a lot of challenges to going to Division I, including financial. It's, a, it's very costly. Um, but there are some, there's you know, both sides of the argument. Uh, there are two sides to the argument. Um, you know, we are one of the largest universities in the country that's Division II. I, I sit on the NCAA President's Council, and most of the other presidents, I think there's 15 of us, we're larger by, than any other university on that president's council by 20,000 students. Most of the, them are in the three or 4,000, 5,000 range. They're only about, only 5% of institutions have more than 10,000 students in Division uh, two. So we're at 27,000 students. 
Uh, so we're a big institution for Division II. But having said that, it is a separate decision, and, and that's one that I think will have to be made well after I'm gone. Okay. Um, but what this, what this does, this arena does, though, is it gives our uh, players an opportunity to play at a, at, a, at a nice facility. But it does it at a, in a way that we can afford to do it because the Pistons uh, will be bringing their uh, a G League team down there and leasing from us. And so the lease rates for the Pistons G League will just about cover the death service that we will have on the arena. Um, not quite, but just about. And, and with the um, um, certain uh, marketing rights and, and naming rights and things like that, it, it might actually cover it. And so I, I think this is really exciting. It gives an opportunity to uh, partner with the Pistons on, on um, uh, a, a, uh, a sport that um, many Detroiters are, are very involved with. You have legends like Dave Bing and others who you know, grew up on, on playgrounds and, um, and had, uh, this gives opportunity for Pistons to uh, bring in kids from the, from the neighborhood and have programs uh, that we could participate with to introduce kids and to uh, uh, basketball and um, uh, cultivate uh, talent uh, with some of these kids. And so I think it's a win-win for you know, both Wayne State and for um, the Pistons. As part of this also, as part of this project, and this was also passed at the last board meeting, um, will be a turf for our, our non-sleep students so that they could play more intramural sports, um, soccer and things like that. So that's all part of the the project, a very nice uh, field for intramurals for the students. You said some of these decisions being made after you were gone. You've been here six years now? Yep. Yep. Proudest moment in those six years? Wow. Um, so there are a lot of highlights in terms of, you know, accomplishments that the university has been able to do. And we've talked about some of those, APLU degree completion award and so forth. But I, I think maybe the proudest is not a moment, but um, an evolution of uh, this university over the past six years. Um, what I don't hear that much anymore is some, a term that was very prevalent when I first came here in 2013, and I hate the term, but it's being waned. Okay. Students will always talk about being waned because you know, they got, their concerns were somehow lost in the bureaucracy and, they, and somehow they feel they got screwed. They didn't, their, their issues weren't taken seriously. They weren't able to get the classes they wanted. They weren't able to get financial aid to um, answer their questions. Um, uh, just whatever, but there, you know, it, it was pretty prevalent. And uh, you know, I'm sure things aren't perfect, but, but I don't hear that as much anymore. And, and, and I think that the, the students, most of them anyway, feel that at least there's an attempt to try to um, be responsive uh, to their needs. It's, like I said, it's not, it's not perfect, but, um, but we're continuing to try to put students first and, and treat them as customers, really. You say you don't hear that anymore. What do you hear that's positive that makes you think, yeah, this is, this is what I came here for, this is what I want to be doing? What's, what's, when you think people say nice things about Wayne State University and you hear it and you say, yeah, that's the Wayne State University that I'm proud to be a part of. So I have um, lunch with students on a routine basis, just at the cafeteria and usually with uh, the provost and with Jacqueline. And we usually have a group of uh, seven, eight, nine <coughs> students that we have lunch with. And so we, we ask them all the time, you know, what is it that they most like and what is it they most don't like or they want us to know about. And consistently, the, uh, the number one comment is that they love the diversity of the place and being able to 
talk to students who are, are different than they are, uh, to be able to grow in that way outside the, the um, um, classroom. And then the second thing that many uh, talk about is the professors that they have, that um, uh, they're committed, that they can, they can talk to them, uh, they seem to you know, care about uh, their success, and uh, there are a bunch of other things. They, you know, many of them who live on, on campus uh, you know, love the fact that there are more food options and things are happening on the weekends and, and stuff. We used to hear a lot of complaints about that um, five, six years ago, you know, much less now. But those are the two things, uh, particularly the diversity part, that students always mention. It sounds like you're saying that the best part is the people. Yeah, I think so. And that's a nice note on which to end. <laughs> President M.R.I. Wilson, thank you very much. Well, thank you. And um, as, as John was saying, we'll make sure that all the questions that were submitted are, are answered. So I appreciate um, your audience and, and your participation and asking the questions. Thank you.